I'm going to read through Prayer Before Birth by Louis McNeese. This is in preparation for your Edexcel IGCSE English Literature exam, paper one. So if you look at the title, it makes it fairly clear what the poem is about. It's a prayer before the birth of a child. Um, it's actually from the perspective of that unborn child, which is quite unusual. Um, you could argue the fact that it is a prayer um, introduces a sense of fear and desperation. Um, and typically, if we think of an unborn child, we think of um, a complete in innocence and purity before they've even entered the world, that kind of sense of vulnerability as well. Um, however, I'd argue typically before a child is about to be born, um, we have great excitement or hope for that child. Um, and that those typical emotions or those expected emotions for this unborn child is juxtaposed with the cynical tone of this poem. Um, there doesn't seem to be any excitement or sense of hope um, from the perspective of this unborn child due to the world that they are about to be born into. I am not yet born, oh hear me. Let not the blood-sucking bat or the rat or the stoat or the club-footed ghoul come near me. Um, so you'll notice on the first line of every stanza, we have, I am not yet born. So this is anaphora. And I think this is just a reminder that it is from the perspective of the unborn child and a reminder of the innocence and the vulnerability um, of the speaker of the poem as well. It always follows with an imperative. Um, so you'll notice I have circled them in um, red all the way through. So, oh, hear me, console me, provide me, and so on. Um, so the imperatives almost sound a little, a, a little bit like they're commanding God to help them. And again, I think the strength of that um, imperative creates a sense of desperation from that unborn child. The images of what they fear in the first stanza are really quite childlike, blood-sucking bat, club-footed ghoul. Um, so I think this um, emphasises the innocence of the unborn child. Um, and I think as we go through the poem, you'll notice the things that they are fearful of, I feel like are much more realistic and maybe our, f our fears, um, or the fear feels a bit more real and realistic. Um, as we continue through the poem. You'll also notice that um, the, there are no end line rhymes, rhymes, but there are internal rhymes. So hear and near, console, roll. Have a think about why uh, McNeese would have decided to do that. I wonder if the first, um, <clears throat> the first word is the imperative asking for help and um, the latter word relates to what they fear will happen to them maybe that's um that's how I'm trying to make sense of it but I'd definitely be interested to hear what others think I'm not yet born console me I fear that the human race may with tall walls wool me with strong drugs dope me with wise lies lure me on black racks rack me in blood baths roll me so we have a lot of alliteration here, um, the D sound, the repetition of the R sound and the B sound and the L sound. Uh, we also have assonance, um, so that is the vowel sound, the OR sound in tall, wall, wall me, for example. Um, the ER sound in lies, lure me, um, or the A sound in racks, rack me, and so on. Um, the things that they seem to be concerned about are um, torture, manipulation, entrapment, so tall walls war me, a sense of entrapment, um, with drugs dope me, that could um, link to the fear of being manipulated as well as being lied to and so on. Um, so there, there seems to be um, a fear of a number of things, but I, I feel like this is juxtaposed with the use of alliteration and assonance because it creates a, almost like a nursery rhyme-like style. Again, that's very fitting for the speaker of this poem being an unborn child. Um, and I think that just highlights how terrifying this world must be for such an innocent unborn child um, to enter into this world of terror. 
I am not yet born, provide me with water to dandle me, grass to grow for me, trees to talk to me, sky to sing to me, birds and a white light in the back of my mind to guide me. In this stanza, the unborn child seems to be more concerned with what they need and they really are focusing on nature for the most part. So we have water, grass, trees, sky and birds. We've got images of nature and this um, great awareness that that is what they need. Um, I think it's worth considering, if I remember correctly, and you may need to double check this, um, if I remember correctly, I think this was written in 1944, um, so that was during the time of World War II, um, a time when the natural world was being destroyed by bombs and so on. So I wonder if they're, they're very much aware of these very things that they need being taken away from them through acts of war. Um, that's one way to look at it. Um, and then in purple I've highlighted white light. This is a metaphor, so they, they, they require a white light to guide them. I wonder what that white light is. Is it wisdom in a time um, like 1944, do you need great wisdom to kind of overcome all these forces against you? Um, but because it's a prayer to God, I, th I think it's more likely to be God, okay? They need that kind of hope and guidance that God provides. I am not yet born, forgive me for the sins that in me the world shall commit. My words when they speak me, my thoughts when they think me, my treason engendered by traitors beyond me, my life when they murder by means of my hands, my death when they live me. Great sense of loss of control in this stanza. It's interesting that this unborn child, before even being born, is asking for forgiveness for the sins that they will inevitably commit. So there's a real sense of hopelessness there that they feel like it's inevitable being born into a world like this that I am not going to be a nice person. I am not going to do nice things. Um, and if you look, they, they don't take um, responsibility for it. They suggest that it will be the responsibility of others or maybe um, due to the influence of the world around around them. And I get that from the repetition of the pronoun they. So this sense that actually the responsibility lies in others. Um, and this, lo this la uh, loss of control um, is through phrases like speak me, think me, um, live me. So it's, that's a passive, um, there's a there's a passiveness in that voice that it's not saying I speak I think so th there's a lack of control there due to where um, they've placed me I'm not yet born rehearse me in the parts I must play and the cues I must take when old men lecture me bureaucrats hector me mountains frown at me lovers laugh at me the white waves call me to folly and the desert calls me to doom and the beggar refuses my gift and my child, my, sorry, my children curse me. Um, so starting this um, stanza with rehearse me suggests that um, there's a sense that they, in life, you do not have the freedom to be yourself. That in, if, if anything, it's almost like you are playing a part in a play. Um, so you've got this extended metaphor, I've just put metaphor here, but actually it's an extended metaphor because we have reference to rehearsal, play, cues, all these type of things that you would, um, uh, the type of language you would expect to be um, related to being in a play or being an actor. Um, so no freedom in, in being themselves. I must play, the cues I must take, the modal verbs suggest that there isn't a, a choice in that either. They don't have the choice to be themselves. They must kind of play along with the role that they are expected to fulfill. Um, but also, there's also this sense almost of, of isolation or this feeling that everything around them is acting against them. Um, so again, we have that passive voice, lecture me, hector me, frown at me, laugh at me. Um, so things are happening at them. They're not in control. They're not doing anything. It's all happening at them. Um, and what is against them? Old men are telling them what to do. Uh, even the mountains are frowning at them. Lovers, who are they? Who are they? They are supposed to be close to, um, are laughing at them. Even their own children um, are cursing them. 
Um, so I feel like the, their fear is that they're going to enter a world and they're going to feel like they're completely on their own, that everyone and everything is against them. Um, I think when they talk about mountain, that the, the natural world against them, mountains frown at me, um, waves call me to follow, folly, desert calls me to doom. I think it's to emphasize the sense of isolation and this feeling that it feels like everything's working against them, even the natural world. You could argue another interpretation. Maybe they have respect for the natural world and um, they realize the power that um, the natural world can have over you. Um, that's something to think about. I'm just kind of thinking as I go along. Um, and I'd be very interested to hear what you think on that one. Um, I am not yet born, oh hear me. Let not the man who is beast or who thinks he is God come near me. Remember, this is around 1944. I think this is in relation to fascist leaders at the time, such as Adolf Hitler. Um, let not the man who is beast, this is a metaphor. Um, let not the man who is the devil, not, let not the man who is evil, um, but who thinks he is God. So how might you behave to think you are God? Do you choose who lives and who doesn't? Do you choose how people think or you think you choose? Um, so that very much could easily link to the likes of Adolf Hitler, who obviously is responsible for the killing of, of many, many people. Um, and introduce such things as censorship to control the way people thought. So it's just an idea. Um, or, you know, it's not just about 1944, it's about potentially the world we live in. Is this relatable to the modern day reader? Can you think of leaders today who, um, in their actions, in their policies, actually um, are doing terrible things? Are they deciding the fate of others um, and therefore think, believing that they are God and can do that. So it's just worth a thought. It's not just about a time of war. Maybe this is in relation to modern times as well. And with that, that, li that links quite nicely to the next stanza. I'm not yet born, oh fill me with strength against those who would freeze my humanity, would dragoon me into a lethal automaton, would make me a cog in a machine, a thing with one face, a thing and against all those who would dissipate my entirety, would blow me like thistle down hither and thither or hither and thither like water held and the hands would spill me so first of all the stanza begins with oh fill me it's a fear of feeling empty is the world that they're entering going to um cause them to lose any kind of substance any kind of sense of self self any sense of humanity and then obviously that's supported with this fear that they will freeze their humanity, you can argue that this is a metaphor for this um, fear, really, that they're going to lose any feelings. Are they going to um, are they going to lack a moral code, which you could argue is what makes you um, human? Um, the fear that they'll be turned into a lethal automaton. Again, another metaphor here. I think of soldiers in this instance. Does this unborn child fear that they'll be just turned into a weapon? Um, will they be viewed by their government not as a human being with feelings um, and rights, but actually just a weapon um, that they can use in times of war? Um, would maybe a cog in a machine? I feel like you could um, refer to this in modern days as well. Um, those that lit, that work in large corporations, so they feel like a cog in a machine. They don't feel like they are um, an individual. Are they seen by their um, by their bosses as just a part of this huge corporation? You could argue as a student, do you feel like a cog in a machine sometimes? Do you feel like... Um, you're you're only seen at, seen for your grades, for instance, rather than you as a human with emotions. I mean, schools have such pressure on them. Sometimes they can fall into that trap of just worrying about the grade that a student um, receives, rather than the person uh, uh, behind that grade. 
Um, repetition of a thing reinforces this fear that they are going to lose their humanity. They will no longer be a person. They will just be considered a thing, something that is dispensable and easily um, used and manipulated for someone else's gain. Um, a thing with one face, a thing, and against all those who would dissipate my entirety. I wonder again if that's something to do with war. This idea that you will be turned against someone else who would very quickly and easily get rid of you um, would blow me like thistle down. So again, is that about kind of being turned against the enemy? Um, if you're not sure what thistle down is, I suggest you um, quickly search for it in Google Images. It's a little bit difficult to explain, but it's kind of like feather-like material or almost like fluff that um, protects a flower. It might be not might, might not be the flower, it might be fruit on a flower, but double check. Um, you'll know what I mean when you look at the image. Um, but if the wind blows, it's almost like a feather. It will be easily manipulated by the wind, for instance. So is that what hither and thither or hither and thither suggests? This kind of directionless, this, um, this substance that is easily manipulated. Um, and then also that fear of them being like water. By the way, these are two similes here, like thistle down and like water. Um, what's, think about the qualities of water. You can't hold it in your hands and in, therefore is, does it lack form? It lacks substance. It's easily manipulated. It can be, depending on what container you put it in, it can change shape. Um, it's easily lost. There's a number of ways that you could look at that. And then finally, let them not make me a stone and let them not spill me, otherwise kill me. So we have this fear of becoming a metaphorical stone, in other words, um, some, someone cold and emotionless. Um, and again, this repetition of, of this, this fear of becoming like water. Um, let them not spill me. Does that mean kind of let them not make me into something that it just has this meaningless existence, this kind of lack of human wholeness? And a very abrupt end with that short sentence, otherwise kill me, or that short line. Um, and that's really sad. This is from the perspective of an unborn child. They would rather die. They would rather not enter this world. Um, so complete lack of hope. For the world or for their lives ahead of them which again juxtaposed to what you would normally expect this is a time when you would should be so hopeful for that child about to be born um okay so form and structure it is in the form of a dramatic monologue it is from the perspective of the unborn child throughout and um, it has eight stanzas it's very clear that these are irregular stanzas so it's free verse no end line rhymes as well um, I've already talked to you about the internal rhyme, however. Um, you could argue the irregularity of the lines might reflect or mirror the, the seemingly irregularity of the world they're about to ent enter into. There's something unnatural about the world that they're entering into where, where human beings are kind of um, harming one another. You could look into that and obviously... Think about your own interpretations as well. You could argue because of the repeated first line, I am not yet born, oh hear me, I am not yet born to console me and so on. Sounds a little bit like an incantation, um, um, which I think links to the, the desperation, this feeling of like, um, of calling out for help. Um, the tone contrasts, as I've said already, with expectations of an impending birth, which should be full of excitement and hope, but instead we have this fearful, critical, cynical tone that's full of anguish. Um, and with that comes um, the themes, the horrors of war, humanity, fascism, fear, manipulation. I'd add one on there as well. How about um, fears of parents... This is really written by a father. It's not really written by an unborn child. Is this really McNeese um, voicing his fear for his future son or daughter? Um, the fear of the type of world that they're going to enter into and how it might affect them.